So although it states that I am affiliated to the Kolowski Musei Zagreb, I'm actually at the moment working in London and that's where I got all my information uh, by working uh, directly with the National Trust. I'm going to present you uh, one case, uh, Sutton House, it's a Tudor house built in 1535 and uh, it's not really visited by hundreds of thousands of visitors. It's only, we're talking about 35 to 45,000 visitors a year. But the way it is managed, it does allow to pay back everything that it's spent. And we, at the end of every year, we tend to break even uh, with our uh, um, only resources. Again, um, I was quoting Monty Python, but we can skip that part. That's something that I really like. It's the motto of the National Trust, forever for everyone, which is really meaningful, <coughs> and they really try hard to do it. They may not always be successful, but they always try to improve the system. And just to give you some facts, uh, the National Trust was funded in uh, 1895. We started with only a few dozen members, and at the moment we have more than five million members. Imagine that every member is paying roughly 65, 65 to 69 pounds per membership. You can do the math. Um, but it's basically our inc annual income for the entire trust, just from trading activities, memberships, tickets, and uh, fundraising, it's almost 600 million pounds. Um, that allows to have 7, 000, more than 7,000 uh, full-time permanent member of staff and almost 4,000 uh, seasonal uh, member of staff. And you understand it's more, we're talking about more than 10,000 people working for one uh, charity that takes care of heritage in Wales and England. And then I know I come from Italy, so I do understand very well the problem with volunteering. And this number may be shocking then, because we got 65,000 plus volunteers. At the, this year, it's 66,000 volunteers. They donate a number of hours worth of 29 million hours, which is basically 12 million pounds uh, of free volunteering. Um, they don't do all the time really relevant works, uh, but they, uh, in terms of conservation, they do assist the conservation stewards, but they don't proactively do conservation and they tend to work a lot with visitors and other volunteers, they tend to work with school groups. We do have a way and a system to certify that they are allowed to, so we do background checks to ensure if you're working with kids you have the permission to do that. And um, they also help us with events and fundraising activities, so that's the area where they really very well perform our volunteers. Um, and then we manage more than 500 properties, historical buildings. They can go from a uh, Georgian house in the city centre of London with only three floors and seven rooms to a state building in the countryside that have massive gardens and landscape uh, under their control. So it's a very large organisation. We also control and manage the sea, uh, 600 miles of the coastline of uh, England and Wales, as well as the Lake District and some other areas of uh, national, uh, natural interest. And, most of the people don't know, um, when you go to Stonehenge, you do pay the ticket to English Heritage, which is 15 to 20 pounds, but when you're actually walking uh, around the barrows in the landscape, that's managed and owned by the Na National Trust, and they don't really have a mean to charge people because it's a free entrance landscape. Uh, just so, you know, the membership, when you join the National Trust as a member, you actually supporting, for instance, the protection of world heritage landscape. And then we have partners around the world. Uh, in Italy, uh, we have the National Trust in Italy, it's called uh, Fondamentale Italiano, but, and then we have Scotland, it's got an independent uh, National Trust, and then Malta, Canada, Bahamas, Barbados, I mean, Zimbabwe, Australia, New Zealand, it's, it's just the beginning but the, the hope is that every country will eventually develop a system like the National Trust so that we can partner and share expertise, and not, not only members, I mean. So, um, talking about accurate management, we all know London is expensive, like any other capital in the world. So, whether it was by case or by 
really good accurate man management. I haven't figured it out yet, but I can say that eventually it became accurate management because they chose to space their main offices in Birmingham and Sweden. And that's because the result that was, there used to be, uh, well, there is still some uh, high level unemployment, so they could reach out those communities. And also the rents are much cheaper compared to London. I mean, London for offices, we're talking about maybe uh, thousands of pounds a, year, a month, whereas in these cities we can go down to a few hundreds or a thousand. So that's the difference. And it's a way to save money that can be then reinvested in, in uh, uh, other operations. And then uh, every property should also try to operate within their budget, although some properties are allowed to uh, not operate as a break and even operate, uh, uh, in profit, but those are cases. And how, do they, how does the National Trust actually address the matter is to create what I call sister properties or more professionally portfolios. So there is a, they tend to have large properties working with medium and small size properties and the large property support with expertise and sometimes funds and storage facilities. Smaller properties, they don't have access to storage facilities. They may have uh, limited funding or not enough staff. So I used to work in 575 Wentworth Road where the staff was one full time and two part times. But the operation of a property doesn't really matter. It doesn't really look at how big is the property because you still have to do catering, retail, membership selling, fundraising, uh, operation management, compliance, business support, and so on and so forth. It was just too much. So by operating within this system, we could call upon certain house and house and other properties in the area to provide expertise. But the National Trust has got also this line of management. I try to synthesize, but it's very much more complicated and sophisticated. Basically. We work in three levels, in three areas, internal, consultancy, and externals. The internal is the one where I work at the moment. I am the sub-property level. And then we have consultants that come in to support people like me. So at the moment, I'm commercial manager and visitor experience manager. That includes four different departments. I'm not an expert of retail or re-catering. I, I don't need to deny that. I mean, it's true. But with this support, I can actually manage catering and retail with some issues sometimes, but I can get at the end of the day satisfied. And the same with all the other properties, that's how it works. If that doesn't work, we can always call upon the externals or go above, uh, go uh, up to the hierarchy here. So wherever you are in the National Trust 500 properties, you're always going to end it up with support. You just need to look for, for, look for it and you will get it. And again, the National Trust really operates with the RACHI. So basically, responsibility, accountability, consult and form. That's um, one of the core uh, topics, uh, matters of the National Trust. Every time you do a work, a job, a ta you're assigned a task, you will always, you always end up in one of these four. So they really tend to look, always look for the answer and always appoint the right person for the job, but also support the person to get the right information out. And I was just thinking that um, George uh, presented a, system, a framework how to assess uh, project uh, development and that's from MORPH, the um, English Heritage developed it uh, some 10 years ago and that's how they suggest you should develop a project. It doesn't matter, it could be a PhD, a new museum, development of a business company, but that's quite useful. And as you can see, this, the team structure, it's, it's a bit different from what we have, but they still have some sort of support uh, and complicated and sophisticated strategy, structure. And then last year, um, I presented compatible tourism, but that was to address problems with mass tourism. Um, but the idea is to create a connection between major sites and small sites, museums as well. And the National Trust is actually doing it because we have properties with hundreds of thousands of visitors a year and properties with only 1,500. That's for a visit, and there is a visitor cap in some, so we need to keep it low. But like ours, it's not really a uh, mainstream property, but we get support from other properties by promoting ourselves, uh, by being promoted by them into, during their visits. 
And that's how the system basically works. Um, it assumes a lot, but uh, the idea is to have site, a major site that will attract visitors and then redirect those to relieve the stress, the stress on the major site. Uh, it would work very well because if it could be put into practice, in Rome, for instance, where we have the Colosseum and Forum Imperiali that are overstretched with the visitor capacity. Um, whereas other sites just outside five kilometers from the Colosseum, we have the Villa di Masenzio and is visited by uh, 10 to 15,000 vi visitors a year. Colosseum, almost 6.5 million. That's how the, just to give you another insight, how it works in the property portfolio. So you have the main offices in London uh, they're more, they're not really large, but they do provide good support. And then you have the, what we call the big sister, and then us, the big sister, and then we're supporting the little one. Um, I know it's a very colloquial way, and I apologize if I didn't come up with a better way to refer to them, but that's really the system. We support each other one way or another. And then we, the family, uh, portfolio resource policy is basically where we can get extra funding, but also the National Trust has got other funding uh, coming from uh, the main offices in Sweden and Birmingham. And that's because every year we have 200 million pounds from membership, 91 from fundraising, 60.7 million from legacies and wheels. And then we have investments, uh, basically buying shares and stocks and all of that, 176 million. Trading, which is retail and catering venue hire, 72 million pounds, which brings to the 600 million income that I mentioned before. But also I discovered recently, the National Trust has got a particular pot of money that cannot touch unless it's an emergency. And they have almost 250 million pounds in that pot and it's in case something happens in the future. So those are money that they're not planning to touch. And overall, the National Trust exclu uh, value, excluding the properties, it's 1.2, got um, 1 billion, 244, 8 million, 80, 880 thousand pounds. Uh, I lost, but it's basically 1.2 billion. Now imagine all this money, uh, if they were to come from the state, no way. 1.2 billion. Where do you find all this money? But that's what the National Trust does. Um, on an ideal museum, that was a, I've been spending a lot of time thinking what we do need. We would need all these figures. The color coded is to help us understand which department is actually uh, raising funds, which departments are in between or supporting these ones, and which departments are using the funds. All of these together they are very much needed. And by saying that how steward conservation role is spending money, it's not a bad thing. We do need to preserve our heritage, otherwise we will not be able to fundraise to have a, bit, a good visitor experience or events at the property. So all of these together, they should work very well. And then I tend to always raise the point that a museum may not have, may have a manager, but may not have a director, just because sometimes Managers are more focused on making the museum sustainable on all levels, whereas the director tends to be more focused on the sustainability of the collection. We need to always find a balance. So we, ideally we would have a museum manager and a museum director combined, working together as two different figures. This is Sutton House. It doesn't look like a Tudor house. It has changed ownership many times and one of the people that lived in 1748 didn't like the style, so he changed the facade. There were no regulations about protecting the facade or historical buildings. But it is nice and it's in certain zone tune in London. But back in the days when it was built in 1535, it was just a tiny village with few houses around, uh, far away from London. <coughs> now it's in the city centre of London. Now, what we have in, in Sutton House are these resources. We don't have large resources, but we have good historical rooms that we can use. So that's the Great Chamber, and that's another vision of the Great Chamber set up for a wedding. And that's the um, Little Chamber, which is where we had dream receptions for the weddings. And that's the Georgian Parlour, where we have, for instance, uh, interviews uh, for weddings. So the registrar will come and check whether you actually you and you know your partner, you're not faking the marriage, and that kind of things. 
Um, yeah, you know, uh, I can't get married in England because I haven't been staying there for long. They were spotted immediately. Um, <laughs> this is how we, for instance, set up the Great Chamber in case we have dinners events. And that's the Well of Bun, which was a 1920s uh, addition to the house uh, by a gents club uh, to host parties, ceremonies, conferences. And now we use it for large weddings, up to 120 people, uh, guests and then the meal reception and then the afterward party and that's how it looks like the community garden we call it the breakers yard it was recently acquired on some 10 years ago uh, by the person that was having a breakers yard and we he left this unusual double deck camper caravan which is quite loved by the kids and we do have almost 16,000 children visiting the house because all the schools around the area they join in the national trust as educational group members that's how we started. In, uh, in, when the house opened in, 90, in the early 90s, we only had three members of staff. House steward, house manager, and assistant custodian, which was actually doing all of these. So it wasn't really a custodian, it was much more than that. Um, and we had quite a few human resources issues because there was not enough time to do all these tasks. So eventually, the house, through really accurate management of financial resources, asking for support from other properties, extra funding from the central offices, managed to get to uh, 6.5 uh, member of staff, uh, three of which are part-time, and five are full-time. And the color code is the same, as you can see. All of us, all, the, my, all my colleagues, we do manage volunteers, except for the house manager. He tends not to have time to be on the ground working with the volunteers, but he would like to. So we went from a budget that was for events uh, just £6,000 a few years ago, and within one to two years we're going to uh, uh, reach 60000 And we're not just going from six to 60 in one year. We are at the moment around 40000 45000 every year. So the next, uh, one of the, my duties is to develop a strategic plan to reach this 60,000 pounds in the next few years. So that's what we're trying to aim. And those money are actually paying for the salaries. Not only those, we have other source of income, but that's what we use this money for. And then that's how the house looks like when we have people in for events. And then uh, London has got one mayor, the, the main one, but then every neighborhood has got a local authority mayor and they tend to come out quite often and he really appreciated the hospitality last year so he left a note and that's an it's a really good sign for us but also for the volunteers uh supporting the event at that time and that's our tiny shop it's not generating hundreds of thousands of pounds but it does make the job we are around ten thousand pounds a year and that's what we really can hope for um, at the moment, we have almost 100 events a year that are generating uh, uh, these budgets. And that's, for instance, uh, another wedding, uh, a civil marriage that we had uh, a few years back. And that's again the one of barn that we had, I showed you the photo earlier. Then we have theat theatrical performances, uh, again in the Wellock Barn or in the Great Chamber. And that's Maria Stuarda by Donizetti uh, being represented in. Uh, starting in three days in case you wish to come um, but what I did highlight here is that they are supporting us by paying a uh, fee but they're not only supporting us they're supporting other national trust properties so this company is working with us mainly but we work together with other properties to share the benefits of having a theatrical performance Retail and catering together, they make £16,000 and it's good. It pays for the three salaries that we have, the part-time ones. And what brought us to is basically we really have a good high level of uh, conservation. And we are listing uh, our museum uh, for the museum accreditation. We have become a community center. I couldn't show any photos of that part because there are sensible groups, participating school groups, uh, uh, people with uh, particular Alzheimer's disease and all of that, but there are, they are using the facilities of the house, the venues, every week 
and that's a really important thing because it's unusual for the National Trust to be actually a, really, a real community centre. We are a big point of reference for schools. As I said, we have more than 10, uh, almost 15,000 children coming to visit the house. We are becoming a prestigious event for venues and weddings and any sort of uh, private function. And then we do manage to break annually uh, our annual financial statement even, so it, that's really good. And the working environment is positive. There is no negative competition between the colleagues, but it is actually positive, constructive competition. Um, or if you're not a large national trust, uh, an organization like the National Trust, it's not a problem. You can still try to reach out your other colleagues in other museums. You just need to make the first step. But it doesn't take much to make a phone call and arrange a meeting. And eventually you will end it up being able to share expertise. Um, food for thoughts. That was that this is my last slide, um, I believe. And uh, it's just to point out some of the topics that I would like maybe to bring also during the discussion. We, do we have a mandate over visitors and beyond? Where do, where do we stop with our job in museums and archaeological sites? What do we need to do? And what is our duty of care? Do, do we take care more of the collection? Do we focus more on visitors? Do we focus more on generating revenues? Where do we find the balance? And creating a positive working environment is fundamental, otherwise you don't really want to see Monday. I do love to see Monday morning because I'm going back to work. Um, and then uh, fast uh, tourism, we were talking yesterday in another session, it's a fast growing market and it can lobby us. It can lobby very badly in uh, heritage. And we were talking about cruises. That it's a market that it's worth billions of pounds. How can we as heritage sector fight back the lobbying that they're doing to us by not being divided first? And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope to see you either in Zagreb or London.